Jiga Chakarja Gurule Mahagat as Violin Nacht Agus Folterov Galer. Hello, everyone, and welcome tonight. Thank you so much for joining us at our second SIF at Home event in 2024 in partnership with NYU DC Dialogues here in Washington, DC. My name is Maeve McCullough. I'm the director of Sullis Nua's Capital Irish Film Festival and our SIF at Home screening series. We're so thrilled and honored tonight to be joined by the filmmaker Pat Collins. Thanks, Maeve. Uh, Pat has made an astonishing 30 films over a 25 year period. And uh, when looked at together, it's an astonishing body of work. Uh, uh, Pat has made an astonishing 30 films over a 25 year period. And uh, when looked at together, it's an astonishing body of work. Uh, titles include The Dance, which is following the staging of Michael Keegan Dolan's Mom, Henry Glassie's Fieldwork, a portrait of the celebrated folklorist and ethnologist Henry Glassie, the amazing song of granite, a dramatic life story of the legendary Shano singer Joe Heaney. It was a nomination for the best foreign language film uh, in 2018 from Ireland. And Fanula Hannigan, the chief critic of Screen International, wrote, in an era of safe filmmaking, especially within the art house sector, it's fair to view a title as formally audacious a song of granite. Pat has made films on the writers John McGahern, including tonight's film, John McGahern, A Private World, the poet Michael Hartnett and Nuala Nidonal, the singer Thomas McCarthy and the Connemara based writer and photographer Tim Robinson. He's directed political feature essay films, What We Leave in Our Wake and Living in a Coded Land, and his short experimental work has been screened at numerous Irish and international film festivals and many galleries, including the ICA in London, the Galway Arts Festival, Visual Art in Carlo and the Crawford Art Gallery. His latest feature film, That the Myth Face the Rising Sun, which is based on the novel by John McGahern, received its world premiere in London at the International Film Festival uh, this past fall. And we're delighted that we will have uh, a screening of the film for its North American premiere at the 18th Capital Irish Film Festival in DC. Pat, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of obviously your very busy schedule to join us here. Thanks very much, Maeve. Delighted to be here. Um, we have tonight, some of our viewers tonight may have watched the film already. Some may be watching the film afterwards. Um, it's an absolutely gorgeous meditation on the life of uh, John McGahern. Beautiful portrait. Um, for those people who may not be aware of John McGahern's writings, um, he obviously is a very important Irish novelist. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, John himself, but also how you came to meet John and make the film. Yeah, um, I think uh, John, I'd say, would would be regarded as as one of the most important uh, Irish writers of the of the late twentieth century. And uh, I think he kind of made an impression first uh, in the sixties, and um, with with books uh, called The Dark and the, and the Barracks. And I think. Uh, then I think when he when he wrote um, amongst women, I think that was nominated for a Booker, and then he became much more widely known. I think around the world after that, uh, even though I think he'd always would have been kind of known and respected. I think among writing circles, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a always a, a long distance between his his books. I think amongst women was kind of ten years into writing, and it was another I'd say ten years before that. The May Face the Rising Sun was published. And um, so he was never, he kind of, he lived on a farm. He, he worked as a farmer, but I mean, he's primarily a writer, but he did some farming on the side as well. And uh, and I suppose he kind of kept out of the limelight. So he wasn't hugely well-known. I'm not sure how well he worked a circuit as such, you know. I, I think he was very much kind of, writing every day and uh and he kind of kept the head down and um but i think yeah he was definitely hugely respected among critics and 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 widely read and especially within ireland and um i kind of thought for a while you know that you know that that when when he passed away in 2006 i thought for a time it seemed like that that we, we we'd lost a, a kind of, it was like the end of an era or, or something, you know, and, uh, but I, I, I suppose Irish writing is very hard to put down and it kind of recovers again. Um, but I think, I think he was very, very, uh, 
I think he, he, the subject matter of his films was it was quite harsh, I think, in the beginning. But then when it came to the, that they may face the rising sun, I think he was after much more kind of acceptance of 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 where he, where he was living, and it was much more of a kind of a celebration, but not not a kind of rose tinted view either. I think very much uh, looking at the reality of of the world around him. And, and, and so when you, um, oh, yeah. sorry, the documentary you did is two thousand and five. Well, I think we started in two thousand and four. Uh, right filming with him in the winter of 2004 and then maybe shot it in 2000 and it was came out in 2005 then and was broadcast in Irish television. So I think we made it over the course of maybe nine months or so. We kind of filmed in, in, in the winter first and then and then over kind of spring into summer and edited over that the following winter. And uh, I think uh, it, it was Philip King who was the producer. Uh, uh, he met, he was on the Arts Council, I think, with with John and uh, I think mentioned to him about the possibility of a documentary. And then uh, Philip asked me if I'd be interested in directing it. And then we met in the Shelburne Hotel in Dublin and, and we kind of, he was just beginning, I, I was in the middle of his memoir at the time. And it was kind of the perfect time to make a documentary. He had, he knew he was sick and uh, he was getting treatment at the time. And he was in that kind of, his mind was in the memoir uh, as well. So it was kind of a good time. He was reflective, I suppose, you know. And uh, I remember when we met first, actually, like he just kind of, he told us, he told, he kind of mentioned about the fact that how the memoir was coming out of him walking the lanes with his mother when he was young. And uh, and then he, and he kind of, it's almost like he kind of gave me the beginning and the end of the documentary right there in that very first meeting. And, uh, but he was like he was very accommodating. Like we we sat for hours, like we've hours of interview material, and uh, which which we cut back to fifty two minutes for for the RT broadcast. But it it was it was a it was a good success at the time. I mean, it was it was very well received, uh, very good viewing figures in Ireland, and uh, and it won a NIFTA then for the best documentary that year. So it was it was and it was a, it was an amazing privilege for me. Because I think he was a real acute kind of reader of the of Irish society, Irish history, and Irish writing, and Irish life and politics generally. So I mean, he, you you learn to from being around him, you learn a huge amount about the yeah, world. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know so much about his life story, or his biography, and especially those early years and and what had happened to him through mm. his mother's illness, but also through the death and then what happened with the transition with his dad. Um, the way you opened it, the quote I actually made a note of was just on the idea of happiness while walking that lane without any of the usual attendance of pain or loss and it disappears as quickly as it comes but I know it goes back to that first lane that I walked with my mother when I was three and I must have been extraordinarily happy walking that lane once you recognize where it comes from it immediately disappears and I can't explain it it was such a beautiful way to open the documentary you really got a sense of this this man mm. in your psyche yeah, I mean, he 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 paraphrased that paragraph to me when we met in 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 the Shelburne. So I mean, it was the opening of the memoir, and it became the kind of the opening of the of the film. But he wasn't reading it; it was just more like he said it more in conversational tones. But it is beautiful, and it's got that kind of prelapsarian thing of kind of before the fall. You know that there was this time that was a pocket of of happiness, and. Uh, and I think it's and it's I suppose everybody can you know understand that to a certain extent because I mean there's a certain innocence to do with childhood, and um, and I think everybody can re remember that I think you know in, in a kind of and our, uh, hopefully they can remember that because there's something wrong in a way if they if if yeah. if you can't, and um, so there's lots of people who probably who probably can't, but um, so that that kind of. It was such a kind of beautiful passage and it was a great way. And I, I mean, the documentary is very intimate, I, I suppose. I mean, I I did kind of, I, when I started off, I thought of, of maybe certain people that might be good people to interview about John's work. And I, I, I threw a couple of names at him at the time. And he he said, look, I think you'll find that I, I, I've plenty to say for myself. In other words, he didn't really want anybody to be talking about his work. And I, I kind of believe in that kind of collaborative thing anyway, that, you know, I I kind of believe that if you're making a documentary about somebody, you really have to 
be very, listen very carefully to what they're saying and and take what they're saying as being a guide for the documentary. And um, so when he when he said that, you know, that he had plenty to say for himself, I kind of gave up with the I gave up the idea of interviewing anybody. And I, and I think it was the right decision. And I think John's instinct Brilliant. was, you know, yeah. I mean, you, you could probably have somebody uh, who would have assessed his work. But it would, I think it might have broken the spell of it, I think, you know, that. And intimacy. also because it was such a it was such a um, an intimate portrait of the man um, and the story of his life that it came from him and his words, because even though, you know, you can obviously tell so much of his life is in his books, um, the fact that he was able just to to talk about those those places and then to go back to those places I thought that was beautiful did you consciously choose when you were mapping out the film over that time frame because you really get that lovely sense of the, the the turn of the wheel of the year as the as the film is progressing um did you plan all that out or was it just you know were you guiding him along the way or yeah you... I mean well I suppose we did want to capture the the landscape in winter time and and like Leitrim is like a lot of Ireland, it's kind of unrecognizable from the summer to the winter. Like I mean, even even where I'm living here, I mean, it's and even growing up, you know, when you're in the winter time, you kind of it's nearly impossible to remember what the place looks like in in, in the summer. And uh, but and so every year you're kind of astonished that, my God, it's back again. Yeah. It actually it totally transforms the landscape, especially like it's in May as well with the with the white thorn. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it's such a an incredible time I think in the country but then so I, I did want to get uh, I did want to shoot in the winter time so myself and the camera person and a camera assistant uh, went up and we just shot uh, John walking some of the laneways and some of the landscape and then we went back I think in in the spring and then went back again in the late su summer autumn and one time I think we, we we spent a whole I think John was away somewhere and we actually went into the house and just shot the the whole house in kind of in detail and uh you know the views from every window the objects in the house and all that and john wasn't there at all and but i, I kind of i felt like it was important to kind of capture the the house and the farm and and uh and leitrim i think and that area and, and how prophetic that you know i don't want to we'll go into it in, in a minute about the actual the the adaptation of the book but that that you're almost like in a sense setting a scene for yourself you know 20 20 years later when you've come to make the film yeah i mean it's kind of uh, well it just feels i mean to use that kind of word that's overused it's kind of feels organic in a way that's uh you know i, I loved that they may face the rising sun when i read it when it came out first and i was kind of astonished by it really yeah. and then i got the opportunity to, to make the documentary on john <clears throat> and i think i would have mentioned it to john at the time about the, the possibility of making a film that's back in 2005, but I don't think it would, it, would, it would have been anything concrete. I would never have imagined that I could have made it in a way at that, at that time, I don't think. So, I mean, it took me until about 2015 before I met Madeline again, Madeline, John's wife, and I had lunch with her and asked her what she thought of the idea of, of, of making Death of May Face Rising Sun into a film. And she, she gave me her blessing and thought it was a good idea, though maybe difficult. So then I approached Eamon Little uh, to, 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 to work on the script. And he was a sound recordist on the documentary. So um, so it, it kind of felt very, and I suppose we had lots of conversations about John's work over the years. So it just felt like it, w one thing led to another and it kind of, it, it kind of grew out of that. Leading uh, you itself, uh, wasn't it, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was leading you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, 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 I suppose it's it's different if you're kind of, I, I, I don't, I'm not too conscious about the documentaries I make, except that it's, I'm conscious in the sense that it's, it, they're coming out of my life and my own interest. So I'm not kind of looking for subjects. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm responding to what's already kind of happening. Now, sometimes I was going to ask you that, yeah, yeah, just in terms of, um, because obviously the, I mean, a, a lot of them are portraits, but what comes across in your work is uh, this incredible curiosity about people, about life, about place, uh, about mm. connection, about belonging. Uh, so is it is it just is it coming from the things that you're reading, the experiences you're having in terms of inspiration to choose? The yeah, you do? I mean, I, I think it, I think it is. I think it's kind of the the whole formative uh, thing of growing up where I grew up in West Cork, you know, coming from 
farming background, probably never having gone to college, yeah. kind of kept me kind of more, again, never gave me a sense that I had, you know, learned everything. I, I Maybe I always kind of feel that I don't know anything. So it's kind of, <laughs> it, it maybe gives me a kind of added kind of impetus to kind of seek things out. I mean, I'm not, I try not to think about it too much, I think, but uh, I'll be too conscious of it. But uh, I don't, I don't look for, I'm not, never kind of contemplated a career or never contemplate kind of I'm not ambitious in that way, but I'm kind of ambitious for every individual project. But I, I just, I feel like myself, I kind of keep the head down and just keep, keep working at what interests me. Now, sometimes you don't have always had the luxury of that sometimes you have to do certain things for to, to, to make a living that you do. You see an opportunity or you're offered an opportunity and you'd say, uh, you know, what should I take it or or should I turn it okay. down? Yeah. But sometimes you just if 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 you've got children and you need to make a living, then you have to actually sometimes do work. But I think you you you're duty bound to give it a hundred percent all the same. You know, even if it's oh, not one yeah. of your absolute uh, passion projects or whatever, everything can't be to that height. You know, um, but yeah, so it's kind of I I I think I'm I suppose Ireland kind of up to now has kind of infinitely fascinated me and I'm kind of interested in in kind of working the material at a deeper level all the time and and to kind of I, I find I haven't even kind of branched out of um I'm, to the point where I'm not kind of I, I can't imagine you know being interested enough to make something almost out, or at least certain times in my life I've kind of wondered if I was offered something in America would I do? Would I do it? And I, I usually think I probably wouldn't. You know, I would. It would. Um, I wouldn't. It, it would need to have Ireland in it somewhere, and I'd need to be kind of plowing the same kind of field that I've been. That, that the things that are kind of uh, obsessions for me, I suppose. I just kind of. I, I feel like I could work for the rest of my life doing the same, working the same material. You know. I hope you do. And I think that the <laughs> that face the rising sun is the same thing. I think it's. Uh, it's all coming out of the same place, and uh, and I, and I think it's a shared thing as well. It's uh, sometimes, you know, it's it's and it's probably coming from a kind of uh, like essentially. John is painting a portrait of a kind of a uh, society that was replicated in different parts of the world, like it's southern Italy or Poland or Slovakia. Yeah. Like small communities where there's a kind of a, an incredible richness of 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 uh, variation, of of different character types, mm -hmm. different levels of intelligence, different levels of of uh, um kind of just even personality types and how they get on and all the different manners that goes along with living in a small place and how you respect each other and uh, John is working that material but it's it's a universal material. Uh, but it's just not a material that is kind of seen, um, you know, kind of maybe by urban kind of, you know, society that's kind of obsessed with the the transient things, I suppose, are are, are less likely to kind of take notice of those kind of um, societies. And I, and, and, I think yeah, and things that are moving fast and, and, and turning over and changing, whereas you get this really sense of deep time not just obviously in the in the film um but also in the documentary mm. uh, i love the scene actually in the documentary where he goes into the town and just his description of going into the town once a week you know to 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 get the messages and get the paper the local paper um but when he stops in the street and he's talking to people and and he said that somebody had asked him you know what are you doing and he's doing the writing and he's like oh is there much money at that and when he when he realizes yeah. that there's not much money to be made at that he's like Oh, it's just it's like another trade. And yeah. you really get the sense, like, even though he'd gone and, you know, many years have passed and he comes back to live in, in that community, he's he's part of the fiber of that community. Like the, the sense of belonging is really, really strong. Yeah, I think I think, um, you know, I, I think rural societies are, are all often very much kind of underestimated in terms of their sophistication and their. Uh, you know, I think I mean, Henry Glassy talks about it. He spent ten years in Fermanagh, looking at at, at uh, a, a small townland up 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 there, near, just outside in Skillen. and uh, and and it was interesting. It would kind of maybe take an American anthropologist to say it in, in a way is that 
that somebody from the outside who would see the value in, in kind of saying that somebody from the outside who comes in, mm-hmm. like once they're inside, they can be very, they can be radical, but they're like small communities will distrust outside if if it's a kind of a radical difference or it's it's or if it kind of in it maybe in somehow endangers that society or but at once, a distance looking at the society yeah but if it, yeah. but if that person is allowed in or if there's a way in that person can be kind of doesn't have to toe the line when they're when they're once they're accepted inside mm-hmm. and i think that's very true when i think back and i think it's true of most rural communities still in relation to say uh, people from outside coming in they're very accepting of it as long as they are are kind of um as long as they're if it is a way in for them to kind of integrate into in, society. Yeah. But it's 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 not something that you can impose. I think it has to be um it has to kind of happen at ground level. And uh and I think I, th- I think rural societies like that are uh, small places. I think there's a radical difference too between from having grown up, I think the rural townland. Is very different to the village and the village is very different to the town and the town is yeah. very different to the city so i think and they're they're marginal differences but they're significant i think i mean i, I think and I, I mean i've only thinking about this recently but i'm not sure that it's held up by any kind of uh learning in terms of i'm not sure there's any studies being done on it but my impression or my memory and my experience of it would be that the, the rural town lands were actually patriarchal and the villages would have been matriarchal, I think. I think that the women ran the villages. I'm not sure if this, is, this other people would agree with me or not. But if I think of all of the next project, <laughs> yeah. But if I think of all the villages, like that, that yeah. all of the shops, a lot of the pubs were all ran by uh, women, you know. And um, yeah, and yeah. but 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 in the in the rural townlands where the people were where the women were living in the farms, I mean they worked incredibly hard you know and um and they kept the whole place going and they didn't get any break from the work i think you know which is where um, nulig man comes from really isn't it that idea that you'll get one day when you get the break yeah <laughs> i suppose yeah i mean it's but I, I do think that i think that maybe the the it's not that the women in the towns and the villages didn't work hard it's just that i think they had more they had more control over their destiny i think than than maybe the the women on the farms now that's maybe a bit too simplistic, and you could go into more detail about it. But uh, I, that's the impression I get, mm-hmm. and um, I think there's. I think again, Henry Glassie talks about uh, a, 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 an eighteen-year-old girl up in Fermanagh, and 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 mm-hmm. I think he said, "What are you going to do on your birthday?" And she said, "I'm going to start walking, and I'm going to keep walking until until uh, I meet somebody who's never heard of Boxty." <laughs> which is the Irish food. And then, you know, only then will I kind of stop, you know, uh, because she just kind of, I suppose, felt that that world was kind of repressive, you know. Uh, yeah. But, that's, but even that's a kind of, a, even that's this simplistic view. It, it is, I think, I think in ways, it depended on the townland and it depended on the people that had lived in the townland and it depended on the, 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 the families and it depended and on lots, lots of different yeah. things, you know. Um, um, and when you came to, so you're saying in 2015, you started to 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 um, look to the to the adaptation. What was the process like in bringing the film together and and making it? Was it a much more slower process because it was a bigger production? You obviously had a huge cast. Yeah, I mean, it was it it, it was it took me, I think. Eamon Little went and wrote the first draft, like went through the novel from start to finish, kind of. The first draft was probably 140 pages and and had everything in it. And then we kind of, so that that was a kind of a fateful adaptation of what the book was there with everything in it. And then we kind of read through it, worked out what characters needed to go and what uh, and what was our main priority. And then it took us years to kind of actually get the script down to. It's a very delicate balance because there's no strict narrative in it. I mean, you're you're actually looking at. I mean, in a way, that's the story or the theme of it is 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 the passing seasons, is time, is all these characters. There's no one big story, um, you know. That's kind of in the way that a lot of other films might be. You're you're so you're not looking at the kind of the narrative arc in the same way. You're you're trying to kind of let space in the script 
for things to be uh, kind of happen naturally and that you you know that you can shoot and you can you can feel the time passing or you can feel the landscape and and the sound of the landscape Mm. impact impact on you but it's very hard to get that across in the script sometimes you know and uh and then it, it takes a long time for people to have faith in it in terms of the funders and all that. You know, it, it's not something that would immediately jump out as a film that has to be made. I mean, I felt it had to be made and I felt uh, I had to do it. But uh, it's, it's it's another thing trying to convince other people that, you know. When did you get to the stage of when you were able to cast and did you did you know who you had in mind? Not, 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 I never, uh, I never, when, when myself and Eamon were working in the script, I don't think, yeah, you know, we threw around a few names, but we never really um, got pinned down to anybody in particular. Maybe it was more types than, than, yeah. than, than particular people. And we did, we did some readings around uh, like a big table in a room with, with actors and, and we did that twice. And I did look at, I did think for a long time of kind of using more kind of non-actors uh, as well and kind of developing it from the ground up. But I kind of, there's something eventually I kind of, I could have maybe spent a year doing that, thinking about that approach. And then and I changed my mind and kind of went in a very different direction and started casting actors. And um, I, I suppose I kind of, that, that film would have been very faithful to kind of work and the routines of work and the, and the you know at, at that time if there was you know a cow calving or whatever I would you know I, I would have probably insisted that we have to film a cow calving or whatever but by the time I got to making the film I kind of felt that there's other things at play we don't need to be as faithful to the farming as I would have maybe 10 years ago you know mm-hmm. that I would have done and so and I felt there was something kind of theatrical about the the book or the the characters maybe that they you know, there's two of them, like Johnny and Patrick, are yes. both amateur actors, and and at the kitchen of Joe and Kate's kitchen, you know, people kind of appear on stage, stage in yeah. the kitchen, yeah. and then they leave, and it, it's kind of like a stage that they come on and off. And uh, I felt that the, the actors who played the characters had a kind of an immense understanding of the characters, um, and helped me enormously in in, in trying to realize who the, uh, those characters. I had a very deep understanding of of, of it actually. And it was the first time working kind of exclusively with actors. Normally I'd work with non-actors, certain actors and working with documentary elements. But this was exclusively with actors. And I was kind of, I was amazed really with with, with what they bring to it. It's kind of, uh, I know it's yeah, maybe it's fabulous, key, it's with directors talking about how great the actors are. But somebody like, uh, say, like Barry, it's so quiet and nuanced and it's so unflashy and unshowy. Mm-hmm. It's he's just listening and he's a, attentive to all the other characters around him. But it's very, very skillful. And and the camera, when it's on his face, you kind of, I think, I think the camera, I think the, I think the modern audience actually is in, in a way is 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 Joe and Kate. You know, I mean, that's the world is being interpreted through them. Mm-hmm. As opposed to the, I mean, there there is an element of their story, but mm-hmm. but in a way, they are our eyes into the other characters and into the landscape and all that. You know, it's so beautifully crafted. Um, yeah, we're so excited to screen it. Your opening is in Dublin on March third. Uh, March third, exactly. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't have we can't have you or or, or Barry or any of the characters. Yeah. Um. Um, I'm afraid where our time is almost up, but I just wanted to. Um, my my son is thank you so much. My my son is texting me there about <laughs> that he's late for a training session, <laughs> so maybe that's uh, that's good. It's perfect that's timing. Really, um, yeah, perfect Pat, timing. it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. It's been such a privilege to watch all of the work that I hadn't seen previously and to see this documentary. Um, it really, really moved me. And uh, I think That's everybody great. is going to be delighted to watch this within our community here. Um, we're thrilled to be able to screen the film. We have the North American premiere on Sunday, March 3rd. Tickets are in sale now and passes are in sale for the festival. It's the best way to experience the festival. We have 37 different titles and uh, we can't wait to share them with you all. Um, so on behalf of everybody at Sulasnua and uh, NYU uh, DC Dialogues, uh, thank you so much and uh, the best of luck with the screening in Dublin. Thanks very much, Maeve. It was a pleasure.